my name is Natalie Kiesler. I work as an instructional designer at Justus Liebig University ever since February 2001. Um, this is part of the project IP Digital, which supports the implementation of uh, the English language master's degree program, uh, Sustainable Transition, which just started a few weeks ago. Uh, with a fully international uh, um, student body. And uh, what I do as an instructional designer is to support uh, students and lecturers uh, with regard to the implementation. So what, what I do is um, I provide information, I consult with lecturers um, on their didactic scenarios, I um, support the development of the curricula, I um, consult um, with the uh, educators with regard to the instruction forms, exams, um, IT infrastructure, use of tools, like for instance, use um, of tools for video production. Um, and that's basically um, like that's these are the core duties of um, my job. And today I would like to talk about uh, video production um, in terms of um, yeah, the didactic setting um, and how to produce them, meaning um, which technology, um, which hardware, software do you need um, <clears throat> and what is applicable in a specific didactic setting. So um, I want to have a look uh, at the timing of the video production because this is crucial for planning. Um, but I also want to talk about the objectives of video recordings, which you can use um, yeah, for, for various purposes. And um, in this way, I want to yeah, present uh, some, some kind of video typology to you today. Um, and this uh, comprises, so to say, the, the video production by educators on the one hand, but also the video production by students on the other hand. So um, I will introduce these types to you and also address the challenges and benefits that come along with these video types. Then I will um, draw a few conclusions um, and then I'll hope that we can um, get into an interesting discussion and I'm happy to answer all of your questions. Um, but I wanna say a few words about myself. Um, I have lots of teaching experience. I've been um, a teacher and educator in various uh, um, areas. I've started with a, with a linguistic degrees uh, several years ago. So I did study um, Anglophone studies with a focus on linguistics. Then I, um, I accomplished a master's degree in linguistics and web technologies. And I'm about to finish my PhD thesis in um, computer science. So um, I'm very interested in these types of technologies, but also competency-based teaching and learning. So this is um, this is my perspective, and I've um, done a lot of further trainings in the area of um, didactics, learning psychology. Um, so I can also um, yeah answer questions related to this um, this area if you're interested. Okay, so first of all, um, I would like to um, take a look at the basic. Um, technology that is required for video recordings. And um, this might not surprise you. I'm sure it doesn't. Um, first of all, what do you need? Of course, a video camera. Uh, if you want to record yourself as a speaker or presenter, um, this can be realized very easily um, with today's technology. Um, every laptop has a webcam integrated. You can use your um, tablet or mobile phone, and by now almost everybody I know um, has one of these devices available. So that's already one of the good news. Um, the same is true for the microphone. Uh, today's laptops or smartphones uh, provide quite a good sound quality. So you can use the integrated mic of your laptop, tablet, mobile phone, or um, for instance, a, um, a microphone that can be connected via USB. These are available for about 150 euros by now, so you can get a pretty professional equipment by now for uh, a decent price. Um, what else do you need for every type of video is, of course, the content. Um, for instance, presentation slides, graphics, experimental setups in a lab, um, etc. And then where it might become tricky for some of you, or or not, <laughs> depends of course on your resources is the software and hardware uh, that you need for the recording and if you wish the, um, the post-production. So uh, depends on the type of, um, type of lecturer, educator you are, uh, you don't need to make it perfect. 
Um, some prefer rapid video production, then you don't might don't even need uh, post processing. Um, but if you wish to do so, um, you can, of course, uh, use a lot of time and effort and resources in this post production and uh, use more professional software such as Adobe products. Um, so there's a wide range available. Um, and that brings me to the point, to the aspect of uh, scalability. Um, you can produce low budget videos like rapid video production um, is what it's referred to with a tablet and laptop, for instance, and the free, freely available uh, screen capture software, or you can use live recordings in a lecture hall or in a hybrid teaching scenario where you need a, a whiteboard and um, an entire studio crew. So um, this is what um, what the, the scale of the video um, results uh, could look like. So you see this ranges from a from a tablet production to a production in a, an lecture hall or uh, to a studio production in that was set up in an office like here at the University of Marburg um, when I was working there um, 10 years ago. So you see, this can become quite complex and I, I don't want to confuse you. So I want to get back to the basics. And that is, first of all, um, the timing of your video recording. And you have basically you have two choices um, I want to talk to you about. And that is either prior to the course or during the course time. And um, I want to look at the two settings now and um, evaluate the benefits and the challenges that come along with it. So first of all, um, you can, of course, record um, videos prior to a course, and um, that can um, be realized, um, for instance, in an office or with your laptop. That depends on whether you want to produce a video or a simple screencast. So as I said, the range of complexity uh, depends on the style you want, the style of video and the type of video you want to produce. Um, and you have a range of options here. As you can see, you can e either use a computer with a screen capture software, um, camera and microphone may be already integrated, but you can also use, of course, an external setup and a setup with an external camera and, um, for instance, wireless microphone. Then you would need spotlights, for instance, um, a space for the projection of the beamer or a whiteboard and flip chart can be used. And of course, you need to prepare the text for the board. Um, you would also need a script if you uh, want to prepare a screencast or a video. Um, and if you would do it in, a off in an office setting, I also highly recommend you a script holder. Um, that, of course, comes along with a lot of work for preparation because, um, yeah, I cannot advise you to do it uh, spontaneously. This will um, lead to a long, long time for the recording, as you probably want to repeat it all over again. Um, cutting also requires a lot of time in the post-processing, so I can strongly recommend you to, um, to pre-plan your recording thoroughly, make a script, make a storyboard, um, and write down what you want to say, because otherwise you will end up um, with a long, long uh, post-processing time. So um, with respect to this, you also need uh, some software and of course your computer again, which should not be a problem. Um, and as a last step for the publication, you will of course need an online platform. Um, I would recommend the use of Ilias or the available learning management system to you because the use of YouTube comes along with its own difficulties in terms of rights and uh, data protection regulations. Um, overall, um, if we look at this strategy and this um, timing of the video production, um, you see it might become challenging with regard to the space you have, um, the equipment you need, and the know-how for the setup and everything. So I would recommend you uh, to create, um, to rather create a screencast instead of a video in a studio. Although uh, Justus Liebig University offers um, a self-recording studio by now and also has a, um, a class whiteboard available. So that's quite fancy. Uh, and if you're willing to try that out, I can also recommend that to you. Um, of course, you also need to prepare all the material in advance, for instance, the storyboard and the script. Um, but you might argue that you need to prepare that anyway. So that should not 
or that does not necessarily has to be a problem. Um, the benefits, um, of course, uh, relate to the high quality of the resulting product and um, the learner-centered approach that comes along with it because students can, of course, learn at their own pace. They can pause the video, they can repeat it, use it for the exam preparation. And that's also what students like the most about um, available uh, um, videos, content videos. And you can also reuse them in the next year, um, apply the inverted classroom scenario, for instance, and become more flexible in your didactic approach. So that's why I love to uh, prepare content videos, for instance. Um, okay. Uh, the second um, didactic setting I want to introduce is the video recording during a course. And um, you can, of course, still do that, even though we switch to the online mode. Uh, I also know that some of you are teaching in a hybrid scenario, so you might still be located in a classroom in front of a blackboard, um, as it is depicted here. And in this case, you, um, you can see that you need a very similar setup um, compared to the previous scenario, except for uh, probably the student assistant um, that um, is yeah, the biggest challenge, I would say, related to this scenario, because you need a student assistant um, that is, uh, um, yeah, that is uh, in charge of the video camera and uh, checks the recording. And you also need to, in case you have uh, students in the classroom, you also need to make sure that the students are not uh, depicted in the video and that um, they cannot be seen. Um, you also need to make sure that you repeat the questions in case questions are asked and uh, you need to be very, thus you need to be very careful about the, um, the recording and the post processes uh, processing in order to not violate any uh, personality rights um, and have students in the videos um, who do not want to be in there. But otherwise, um, it is quite similar. As you can see, you also um, um, need a video camera, microphone, um, but you can also use a whiteboard, a graphic tablet to write on it. Uh, you also need a screen capture software, but you can also use a document camera and you need a pre or you should have a prepared script. So the preparation is quite similar uh, to the previous scenario. Uh, but as I said, it can become challenging with regard to student support, hardware, uh, because you need another type of video camera um, that can um, cover the long distance between you and uh, the audience, etc. And uh, you also should practice the legibility of your handwriting that uh, can become very challenging for some educators and students. Uh, if students cannot read your handwriting on the board, that might become very frustrating. Um, and yeah, you might not be as happy and pleased with the result as you should be. Um, if you record a lecture, you should be aware that um, the videos can become quite long and uh, have less interaction, which is less recommendable. So uh, this is a point you should consider before deciding for that type of video recording. Um, but on the upside, the videos, of course, are reusable as well, and uh, you can use them in the long run, in the long, in the long run uh, for students' exam preparation, for instance. So students, of course, are also very fond of that type of video recording. Um, <clears throat> so another um, aspect we should consider before deciding for um, videos is the objective of the video production. And um, the obvious first um, objective is the delivery of content. And um, yeah, I can confirm that from my own perspective. At some point, I was bored by repeating the definition of phonemes and morphemes and lexemes and the definition of all of these terms um, that repeat um, or that have to be repeated in every seminar. Um, so content delivery is a very, very common objective for the production of videos. Uh, but as I said, you should be very careful uh, with the length of those videos because um, cognitive psychology tells us that these videos should not exceed like 15 to 20 minutes max. And the shorter is rather better than um, yeah, 90 minutes um, of lecture recordings. Um, the good thing is that you can record them prior to a course and um, 
that you can, for instance, align the video production with a specific didactic setting, for instance, uh, the completion of certain tasks or um, even an entire didactic setting like the flipped classroom, um, where it's where it is the core that you free up the pressures in class time uh, for more interactive tasks like discussions or student questions. Um, yeah, so you outsource the basic knowledge, as I said, definitions, terms, concepts, everything that students can read through by themselves. Um, and you can rather focus on yeah, student questions. And this is why it is a learner-centered approach um, to provide videos, because they allow for repetition, reviewing, pausing, and uh, learners uh, following um, up with the contents at their own pace. And as I said, the good thing is um, this type of video is applicable to all subject areas. So in every research area and every field, there are some basic knowledge, some basic contents that, um, yeah, you have to repeat um, every semester, every term. So I'm sure there will be something um, in your seminar, in your course as well. Uh, in general, uh, the challenge is, of course, the time consuming preparation. Um, anyway, you have to prepare these things, even though um, you decide for, for a rapid video production. Um, I cannot sugarcoat that to you. <laughs> so uh, there is always some uh, amount of additional work that comes along with video production. Um, furthermore, you depend on the technology and the infrastructure. So if Ilias, for instance, is down, you and your students will have a problem. Um, there's uh, not much you can do about that. Um, and another uh, word about privacy and copyrights, uh, you should be cautious, of course, um, if you uh, intend to, um, to record students. So you should, um, you should uh, um, uh, get a, a declaration from them that they are okay with that. And you should also be aware of copyrights, image copyrights. Um, so um, the images that are contained in your presentation should be... Um, citated in a correct manner. Okay, another uh, type of video I would like to recommend to you is um, the information video or video uh, for course organization aspects. And I'd, I'd like to uh, recommend uh, to you that you prepare all the um, information regarding learning outcomes, expectations, contents, deadlines, um, tests and exams very early into the semester. And if you uh, do connect this to the electronic course directory, uh, you can make sure that students' expectations um, are aligned to yours even prior uh, to them deciding to participate in your course. So um, that's a very powerful tool, in my opinion. Um, a benefit for you is that you do not have to repeat these um, informations to all students who are getting into your class late. Uh, so you do not have to repeat yourself every time a new student uh, joins your class. So this is very effective and saves you a lot of time, uh, which is why I like this, um, this type of video a lot. Um, the challenges, as you can see, um, they are pretty much the same as in the previous uh, scenario. So of course, it's, uh, it's time consuming, but as I said, it saves you a lot of time on the other hand. Uh, you're still dependent on the technology and infrastructure, and you should be, of course, cautious about uh, image copyright. So only use graphics and images that you are allowed to use. Um, a last type of video I would like to introduce here um, is the provision of sample solutions. Um, and this can be also very powerful if you provide um, solutions to uh, some exercises and tasks which students were supposed to solve uh, during their um, self-directed learning phase, um, because it can help students a lot if you provide some kind of solution um, in order to help them not get frustrated with the contents or the problems they cannot solve on their own. So this is a way of uh, supporting student learning, um, even though they are alone at home and have to solve a task and they yeah, they cannot um, get forward or move forward um, on their own. So this is um, this is a, an interesting alternative or supportive measure um, I can also recommend to you. Uh, here you can see a former colleague of mine uh, in Jamaica who um, yeah described how um, 
uh, a language samples can be analyzed with regard to their um, morphemes and the suffix and how it is pronounced. And uh, you can, for instance, explain how something is done, how data is analyzed, or how experiments are conducted. So this is more about the um, the, the know-how, not the know-what um, of, um, of learning. And again, challenges remain the same as with all types of videos. Um, this list, of course, is not complete um, because there are many more um, objectives you can um, uh, you can have with your video production. You can, for instance, also um, create um, videos with feedback on uh, students' uh, term papers or or student project results um, by you know uh, showing the, the the student product, the learning artifact on your um, screen, and recording yourself talking about it. So feedback videos would be another type of video um, that I could imagine. Um, as I said, this list is certainly not um, not complete because there are many other ob objectives um, you may have. Okay, um, but here I want to continue now with the uh, uh, student video production, which can be another very valuable um, scenario for using videos in, um, in online teaching and learning scenarios. And I've used this scenario quite successfully quite successfully myself um, in 2020. Um, I let students, for instance, elaborate contents and become content experts. This is the um, so-called method uh, teaching by learning. In German, it's Lernen durch Lehren, which was coined by uh, John Paul Martin. And you probably heard about this. So you let students elaborate contents and uh, create a presentation, which was then illustrated by various tools. And on the right hand side, you can see how creative students became um, with regard to the realization of the video. So you see they made drawings by themselves, they recorded themselves. Um, and there were many, many uh, creative solutions. Um, and students had a lot of fun um, and were very successful in the seminar. Um, other methods uh, that you could use um, in the context of video um, production are problem-based learning. So you could um, let students document how they um, solved a problem uh, by means of a video, or you could also let students produce videos as a result of research-based learning. So they could introduce their um, research results. Um, and at the same time, of course, students will always um, gather more media literacy um, and get better at performing with regard to video production. So uh, students learn, and on the one hand, they um, elaborate content knowledge and get um, content experts, but on the other hand, they also become more competent with regard to um, media, media production, and gather more media literacy. So this is kind of a win-win situation for the students. Um, there are many tools um, available for uh, student video production. Uh, as you probably know, there are many freely available screen capturing softwares available, such as OBS Studio, Screencast-O-Matic, or some um, software tools um, that offer a 30-day free trial version. Um, if you want to keep it simple, uh, you could also use the PowerPoint recorder or the Windows internal recorder. So there are also some uh, options available for students where they do not have to spend a single buck. So this is also why I like this approach. Um, there are, of course, more fancy tools, as always, uh, like PowToon, Videoscribe, or whiteboards that you can use. Um, as I said, students will get very creative if you offer them this task because they can experience uh, self-regulation, self-autonomy. So this is also why I like this approach. Um, okay, so um, this already brings me to the conclusions or to the first conclusions before we uh, can start our discussion. Um, as I said, I recommend you to um, decide on a didactic scenario first and uh, think about your learning ob objectives. So what is it that you want to uh, accomplish by means of your own video production or um, by students' video production before you consider an actual type. So what is it that you want to achieve? Do you want to provide content so that you can free up your in-class time uh, for more discussions? Or is it that students should become experts in the field and develop media literacy? So what is the goal? 
And then you can uh, decide on who's going to produce the videos. And um, in this context, you should also um, yeah, reflect on the resources that are available to you. So do you have a lecture hall with the respective technology available? Do you have a self-recording studio? Or do you just have your laptop uh, with an integrated mic and camera? So that a screencast would be the better option for you. Um, and the same applies, of course, to your students. Uh, as you should always offer them the respective help and guidance with regard to the tools. Um, and uh, to sum that up, in my opinion, video recordings um, and e-lectures or um, student videos are a very powerful instrument as part of your didactic toolkit if you bother to acquire the technology or get the respective support. So um, I would like to invite you to contact your IT service center uh, for more information. And uh, here in Gießen, we have um, a team, uh, which I'm a part of, uh, the team media and e-learning, and we'll be happy to support you in the process.